So we were talking in the previous class about um, sampling. And we talked about the Nyquist sampling theorem. Which basically said the sampling frequency must be strictly greater than the maximum frequency that's there in the signal. Right? So omega is greater than two omega m. This was the important result we talked about in the previous class. And let me remind you of the picture or the system diagram. This is my signal XT. This is my PT, which is summation. N equals minus infinity to infinity. This goes through a low pass filter. And then we have a reconstructed signal XR of T. And assuming that this two pi over t, which is omega s, it's greater than two omega m. If this is if this is the case, then x r of t is equal to x of t. Oh, there was another thing: the cutoff frequency. This is all a recap from the previous class. So here, the cutoff frequency omega c must satisfy omega m less than omega c less than omega s minus omega m. So omega c is the cutoff frequency for the ideal low pass filter. Okay, this is a very quick summary of the previous class. The second system we talked about was the system with zero order hold. where the idea was I have XT that gets multiplied by PT. It goes through a zero order hold system. And then it goes through some sort of filter, complicated filter, and then we get XR of T. And the zero order hold system here, the impulse response of this particular system is given by this. H of T is constant one all the way until zero to capital T. And then after that, it drops down to zero for the rest of the time horizon. So that's the impulse response of the zero order hold system. Okay, this was the second part of previous lecture. Any questions about the recap before we proceed with the with this particular system again? Okay. No questions. So let's go back to the first system, this system. And let us look at it again uh, from let me try to see if I can copy the whole thing. I did have a quick, possibly stupid question. Uh, there is a zero order hold. Is there a first order hold or a second order, order, order yeah. hold? Yes, we will talk about it today. You see the first order hold here? Uh, we will talk about the first order hold system in a few minutes. What happened? No. Okay. Let me try the old fashioned way of keyboard commands. 
no. I should be able to copy it. Copy. Okay, great. So let's look at this in the time domain. So we talked about it mostly in the frequency domain in the previous class, and I showed you how the frequency of XRT, assuming all these nice conditions hold, the, uh, the Fourier transform of XRT is exactly equal to the Fourier transform of XT, and that's why XR of T would be equal to X of T. Uh, the situation in time domain is slightly more complicated, so let's look at it purely from the time domain perspective. Okay, so we are not going to appeal to the frequency transform in, in, in this particular part. So in the time domain, I have XR of T is equal to XP of T times H of T. This H of T is the impulse response of the low pass, ideal low pass filter. And here, XP of T is given by summation X N T delta T minus N T. N goes from minus infinity to infinity. H of T, which is the inverse Fourier transform of H I L P J omega, that's given by a complicated expression, omega C capital T sine omega C T. Okay, so XP of T is an infinite sum. H of T is a pretty smooth function. So we can compute this convolution. Let's try to do it. XRT equals to summation K equals minus infinity to infinity. Oh, this is a continuous time convolution, so minus infinity to infinity, xp tau, h, t minus tau, d tau. Uh, xp tau is n equals minus infinity to plus infinity, X N T delta tau minus N T I'm going to take the summation outside and I'm going to take the integral inside. I can do that uh, without any problem because all of these are nice functions. So I can interchange the order of integration and summation. And what I have is X of NT delta T minus oh, tau minus NT and then H of T minus tau T tau. Anyone knows what the integral looks like? 
I'll let you guys copy and then think about this integral and tell me what is the value of this integral. Since you have the delta in there, wouldn't it just be the original function, but at uh, nt? Right. So what? So can you tell me what the expression is? So this is this doesn't depend on tau at all. So I can just take it out of the integral, and then just uh, h of t minus nt. Right. Perfect. Okay. So this is my recovered signal x of r x sub rt okay any questions in this convolution integral i'm struggling to remember how the h of t is uh, is found uh, sorry what you don't you don't remember how h of t is calculated when you, from going from the h of t to the minus tau to the where we just went now, I'm, I'm struggling to remember how we got there. Oh, so that's because integral of delta t minus t naught f of t dt is f of t naught. This is the uh, idea. Okay, yeah. Yeah. That makes more sense. Thank you. Uh, there was another question. No, I had the same one. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So yeah, I think this particular uh, integral, we have seen this several times during the entire course. So I definitely want you all to remember it. Uh, I think this was covered in lecture two or three. And this is one of the most important integral. This is how delta functions are defined mathematically. For any continuous function, you take the delta, you take the integration with respect to delta and you recover the function f at t naught. So uh, we just use that particular integral. And so this x of nt is constant. So I just wrote it here. It doesn't depend on tau. And then this is delta of tau minus nt. So this is my t naught. And this is my h of t minus tau. So I just replace tau with t naught. And I get h of t minus nt. All right, no further concerns about this integration step. Let's uh, move forward. So I can write my reconstructed signal x sub r of t as summation x n capital T. And then I'm going to replace h of t minus n capital T with the expression, which is omega c capital T over pi and then sine of omega c t minus nt. And let me, for the time being, write it as a n, not a n, a n is already used. D n, e n, have we used e n before? No, we probably have not. So I don't e think we have. So this is my e n, and this is, let me call it f n of t. And so Nyquist theorem said that, well, XR of T is equal to X of T under appropriate assumptions.
xr of t is equal to x of t under appropriate assumptions. Okay. So in other words, if I, if I can write this whole process all over again, in other words, what I can say is I have a data set. I'm going to make a connection to machine learning, the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence now, which is sort of a side thing from signals and systems, but I think it's important to make that connection because of the mathematical similarities between what we are studying now and what's actually done in machine learning and artificial intelligence as a field, uh, because there is a very important connection here that is typically not taught as part of signals and systems class, but I still want to do it. So we have a data set, which is N, NT comma X NT. This is my data set n equals minus infinity to plus infinity. And I plug it into a system. I mean, let me replace the system with an algorithm because one can view an algorithm as a system, uh, but it's, it's, it's more of a mathematical statement rather than a real statement. So I have this data set NT and XNT. I pass it through an algorithm, which is through this low pass filtering scheme and all that. And what I get is summation of EN, FNT, where EN depends on the data set and FN of T is basically this particular function that we have picked. N goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And this exactly specifies the function itself, x of t. Okay, so now what, I, what we were doing in the context of uh, sampling and passing it through the low pass filter, now I've given it a different name. So instead of saying, oh, I'm sampling a signal and I'm passing it through a low pass filter, I've given it a different name. I'm saying I have a data set and I'm passing it through an algorithm and the algorithm spits out a function, which is summation of EN multiplied by FNT. And it turns out that this function is actually exactly equal to X of T, which created this data set in the first place. Function X from R to R created the data set. Okay, so I've, I've just renamed my entire idea. Okay, I, I'm not doing anything fancy here. I have a function X from R to R. Um, I, I don't know what that function is. So what I do is I sample from that function. So NT is my input to the function. X of NT is the output to the function. So I've sampled it. I've created a data set out of it. I pass the data set through an algorithm. Now, typically these algorithms, if you, if you have read sufficient number of news, they will call it a machine learning algorithm or they will call it an artificial intelligence machine, artificial intelligence, and so on. And then they say, well, I pass the data set through this artificial intelligent algorithm or this machine learning algorithm. I get a function out of it. And I'm going to use this function for running an autonomous car or for running a machinery or for uh, you know, vacuuming your house and this and that, right? So 
machine learning and AI is being used uh, in a lot of different situations. And what you are studying about this Nyquist sampling theorem and whatnot, it's basically saying that a specific class of functions that satisfy Dirichlet condition and therefore for which Fourier transform exists. And assuming that that function is band limited, which means that the maximum frequency is uh, omega minus omega m to plus omega m. And assuming that your sampling rate capital T is small enough so that you are sampling at a frequency which is much higher than the, the omega m or two omega m, uh, then you can reconstruct the function exactly. Okay, and this sort of, so of course Nyquist sampling theorem is something that's very specific to signals and system and it's being used for situations where you are sampling uh, very frequently, uh, but at a specific frequency, but in more broader sense in the machine learning community, this sort of idea is known as function approximation theorem. Okay. And why approximation? Because of course you can't take an infinite sum like an algorithm or something that runs on a computer cannot have infinite number of uh, output. So what you typically do is you do n equals minus 100 to plus 100 or some minus n to plus m e n f n t. This is what comes out of the computer. And you use this for all sorts of uh, different applications. Okay, so there is a connection between what we are studying now and the whole field of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I just wanted to make that apparent uh, today. And of course, if you if you are interested in the machine learning field, you have to take classes like optimization that I teach, uh, EC5759, or you want to take some other courses on reinforcement learning and machine learning and all that. There are multiple such courses in our department and in CSE and mechanical engineering and so on. So you can take those courses to learn more about it. But remember that all of it stems from this underlying idea of, of signals and systems. Uh, now, if you want to understand applications, you take courses in EC and, uh, and, and CSE. If you are more interested in the theory, you have to take what is known as a math class real analysis and functional analysis where some of this stuff will be talked in much greater detail and a lot of mathematical foundations for all this stuff that we have studied in signal and systems are built in these two classes okay this is just a minor uh, excursion we have made from the signals and systems class any questions about this part Okay. All right, so this is my reconstructed signal. And in most situations, these signals are, uh, assuming all the conditions are satisfied, this is equal to X of T. Then we talked about the zero order hold system. So this is, uh, this is without any hold. Then we talked about zero order hold system where you have this function X of T or signal X of T. And you sample and then you hold the signal for some time. And you get something like this. This is the zero order hold. Now let's talk about first order hold system. have the same signal 
t and now i Um, so this is the sampling interval. And now what I'm going to do is I will just do a linear interpolation in these two points. So the gray line is linear interpolation and this is known as first order hold So in the zero order hold system, the output XP of T or not XP of T, uh, the output after the zero order hold. So let me write X Z O H. This is my X Z O H of T. So my X Z O of H of T, it features a lot of jumps. Okay, so every time the number changes at the sampling time, then, then there is a jump in the output of the signal. And such jumps in some cases are not necessarily nice. Okay, people don't like such jumps or the system may not be able to take so many jumps so frequently. Assuming you are sampling at let's say 10 Hertz, then you have 10 jumps every second and the system may not perform very well with so many jumps throughout every second. So in those cases, it may be more appropriate for you to use the first order hold where what happens is you're doing linear interpolation between two time steps. And because you use linear interpolation, uh, the function is more smoother. The, the, the linear interpolated function, so let me call it X first order hold of T. So that's this gray line that you're seeing. And this is continuous. So it doesn't have jumps anymore. Uh, but the but there is still discontinuity in the slope. So the slope is discontinuous. So you have a system which does zero order hold. So in zero order hold case, there are a lot of jumps in the output. Uh, this is not the re reconstructed signal. This is just the zero order hold uh, part. So we are not talking about XR of T. We are talking about a step before XR of T. So in the zero order hold case, uh, there are a lot of jumps. We don't like jumps in some applications. So we would like to smoothen out the, the output. So in that case, what we do is we use a first order hold system where even though the output is continuous, so X FOH is continuous, but there are still, the slope basically changes quite abruptly at every sampling time, right? So that's apparent. Now, again, there are some cases where uh, you don't want the slope to be discon discontinuous. And one simple example is when we are driving a vehicle. So assume that your X of T is the acceleration accelerator position. No, maybe the X of T is the velocity. Um, should we use velocity or? Well, let me tell you where this slope discontinuity becomes a problem. So let's say you are driving a vehicle and your the accelerator pedal position is what your X of T is and it goes through a zero order hold system, then what you observe is when you, if you are a passenger in the vehicle, you will see that the, the vehicle suddenly accelerates and then it decelerates and then it accelerates and then it decelerates. So it creates a very bad 
sort of uh, feeling inside the car it's almost nauseating to be sitting in such a vehicle which either accelerates or decelerates so then so you're just driving stick well poorly <laughs> Well, you know, so so yes, if if you're the if you're a new driver driving a stick, then that is what the situation will be. But I think uh, typically drivers who are who have been driving stick for a long time, they kind of understand how to press the accelerator to smoothen out those bumps. So they have that experience. I mean, I don't drive stick, so I don't have that experience. But I know people who drive stick for for long time. They 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 know how to deal with that situation. But yes, you are right that if you're a new driver driving stick, that's exactly how your velocity output is going to look like. So, so it's very uncomfortable for the riders or for the passenger. So you would ask the driver to drive more smoothly. So the driver is going to use this first order hold type mechanism to, to smoothen out this, uh, this acceleration deceleration profile. Um, but even then, sometimes, you could have like a very discontinuous slope, which is known as a jerking motion because the accelerate, acceleration itself is changing very rapidly. So those are known as jerking motion and even that creates some problem to some riders. And so in that case, it's better to do a second order hold, not the first order hold, which does Q, uh, quadratic interpolation between the functions. So that would be a, This is my X of T second order hold. And hmm. instead of doing linear interpolation, now we will be doing quadratic interpolation. So now I have, oh, I don't want to use, let me use some other color. So I'm going to use quadratic interpolation something like this. And of course, uh, uh, it's much, much smoother in the second order hold case and, and so on. Like you can go to higher order holds as well if even second order hold is not good enough for you. Uh, but, 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 but there are multiple ways by which you can hold the signal for the time interval NT to NT plus one or N plus one T. Um, and, and zero order hold, you keep it constant in first order hold, you do linear interpolation in second order hold, you do quadratic interpolation. In image processing, if you have like a sophisticated image processing software like Adobe Illustrator and whatnot, uh, you will see cubic interpolation when you are subsampling or oversampling the image. So cubic interpolation is what's used in image processing world um, and computer vision world for, uh, for either minimizing the size of image or, or extending the image to a higher resolution. So let's look at mathematically what first order hold does. Any questions so far on this type of stuff? Okay. Um, Let's look at the first order hold uh, sampling. Well, sampling with first order hold. So in this case, I have my X of T. I have P of T, I get X P of T. I pass it through a first order hold um, transfer function and then some sort of filter. It's not a low pass filter, it's some other sort of filter and you get the reconstructed signal XR of T. So in the first order hold case, your H of T actually looks something like this. This is zero, this is T, this is minus T, this is one, this is T. And I want to write that the transfer function of first order hold 
would be given by one over capital T Okay, now in many cases in real world situations, you don't want to add another filter because it will add complexity to the problem. And as you can see in the previous uh, previous slide, with first order hold, your x r, I mean your your x f o h is almost equal to x of t, right? So x f o h of t is almost equal to x of t. So you can just ignore the filter. You, you can choose not to have any filter. Because my X F O H, this is my X F O H of T. X F O H of T is approximately equal to X of T. In which case we will just remove this filtering part. Okay, any questions so far? So in contrast, yeah, go ahead. Can you scroll back up to the graph of the uh, second order hold? Yeah, of course. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so let's look at um this is without filter as i mentioned you can ignore the filter because your approximation xr of t is almost equal to x of t let me write what xr of t is exactly x first order hold of t which is approximately equal to x of t so i've basically removed the filter from here so this is my signal x of t and x of p sub t um, by, by sampling the signal x of t. Um, this is my h of t and the two signals x p of t and h of t, they would be convoluted to get the x r of t, which is just a linearly interpolated version of x p of t. This is the linear interpolated version of x sub t of t. And this is the h first order hold g omega. And this is H of ILP J omega.
Okay, any questions so far? So let's talk about the next topic, which is undersampling. And aliasing. So the idea in undersampling is as follows. Let's consider that you 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 got you got uh, sick and tired of electrical engineering curriculum and you switched your major to physics and you wanted to do astronomy for the rest of your life and you took up a job in nasa and you are asked to design the next telescope which is going to capture the birth of a black hole from neutron star from rotating neutron star now if you look at the actual engineering device you probably will be able to sample every microseconds or something, assuming it's reasonable uh, thing to do. In uh, so 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 each of these rotating neutron stars are going to create electromagnetic waves, and you want to capture those electromagnetic waves using uh, some uh, device that is sampling at a megahertz frequency or a gigahertz frequency. However, when when you are very close to the creation of a black hole event, at that time, they are spinning actually extremely fast. And in those situations, the, the sine waves that will be emitted from those stars would be like this. Whereas your sampling can only happen at gigahertz scale. So this would be very high frequency. but your sampling is, is very low frequency in comparison. Okay, so in this case, there is no way to get around it. Like you want to capture the entire signal that's coming out of those neutron star, but at the same time, you know that there is no engineering tool available to sample at that high of a frequency so that you can exactly reconstruct using the Nyquist sampling rate. You can exactly reconstruct the signal coming out of the neutron star. So now you have a problem and you have a problem of undersampling, which means that you actually do not know how to process your data that's coming out of your sampling process. You, you have to come up with a better way to, sample, uh, to process the data so that you can reconstruct this event exactly, okay? So the question is, how do we do that? So that's the problem of undersampling. So you cannot really sample at the frequency at which you want to, so that you can capture the effect that's happening in the, in the underlying signal, okay? And this leads to what is known as aliasing, and that's what we are going to discuss now. The other situation where this appears pretty often is when you are taking a camera and you are um, uh, you're using a camera to record a rotating wheel. And because cameras typically capture images at 15 images per second or 30 images per second, uh, there are situations where you will see that the wheels are actually rotating backwards rather than forward. Uh, and that's because again, your camera is under sampling uh, in comparison to the rotational speed of the wheel. So I want to show you a, a quick video where this happens. So you see that this is a wheel, this is a rotating wheel, and this is rotating in this direction. And this red, uh, this red bar, you, you can view them, view, view that as your uh, sampling. So every time you see this red bar taking one turn, that's your one sample. Okay, so just keep looking at this red bar and see what happens as the rotational uh, speed of this particular wheel changes. Oh, yeah, this is uh, rotating in a slow motion. And now the rotational speed is getting increased. And we see that the red part is moving in the right direction.
and the speed increases and now the red has changed its direction. Now the red is moving in the opposite direction as the wheel. And this is the effect of aliasing because you are under sampling. And you can see the white thing also, the white thing also can be viewed as sampling. And as you can see, the white thing is also sometimes moving in the clockwise direction and sometimes it's moving in the anti-clockwise direction, even though the wheel itself is moving in the anti-clockwise direction. So all of this is uh, this issue of under sampling because your camera's speed of taking a picture is different from the speed at which the wheel is rotating and the wheel is rotating at much faster frequency. And so you see this effect of aliasing. Okay, let's go back to our lecture. So the question is what happens when you are under sampling? That's what we want to study. So let's study it through an example. So let's say my X of T is cos of omega naught T, which is equal to one over two E raised to J omega naught T plus one over two E raised to minus J omega naught T. And omega s is a sampling frequency. Omega s. And the cutoff frequency is half the sampling frequency. So the cutoff frequency omega C is exactly equal to omega S over two. So such an omega C would satisfy the, so assuming two omega m in case, or two omega m, so here omega m is equal to omega naught. So two omega naught is less than omega s, then omega c is omega zero. Okay, so we can take this as a cutoff frequency for the low pass filter. So I fixed my low pass filter based on the sampling frequency and my sampling frequency is omega s and my omega m is equal to omega naught, which is the, the frequency of the original signal cos of omega naught t. Okay, now let's look at what my x of j omega is and that's one half delta omega minus omega naught plus one half delta omega plus omega naught. Oh, do I have to put pi here? Maybe pi, yeah. Okay. 
right right there has to be pi here okay so it's pi delta omega minus omega naught plus pi delta omega plus omega naught so that's my x of j omega let's look at xp of j omega and that's summation x of j omega minus k omega s uh, k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So I got this particular expression from the previous class, lecture 25. Okay, so let's, and then you will apply a low pass filter and then let's try to see what happens for various values of omega naught and omega s. What exactly do we get after applying the low pass filter? So we'll see a graphical representation of that. So this is my original X of J omega. Uh, this is omega naught equals to omega S over six. And this is my low pass filter, minus omega s over two to plus omega s over two. So we see that I can recover my, if omega naught is omega s over six, then I can recover the original signal because the entire signal is within this uh, low pass filter interval omega s over, minus omega s over two to omega s over two. Now let's increase the frequency omega naught. So this is omega naught equals to two omega s over six. And we see that of course this omega naught is close to omega s over two, but, but we are still able to recover the signal exactly because the dotted line and the solid line within the, it, there's only one dotted line and one solid line within the minus omega s over two to omega s over two frequency range. I want to remind you, this is the H I L P of J Omega. Okay. Now, so even under this case, the Nyquist sampling rate holds here, the Nyquist sampling rate holds. Now let's consider the case where Omega naught equals to four Omega S over six. And the Nyquist sampling rate does not hold in this case. What do we notice in the XP of J omega? Anyone sees something very peculiar happening here? What has happened? Within the, just look at this H I L P J omega. Just look at things happening between this, in, within this low pass filter area. Okay, let's, let's look at it. So we have omega naught and we have a dotted line at minus omega naught. Now look at XP of J omega for this case. So in this case, we see that you have a dotted line at omega S minus omega naught. And we have a solid line at minus omega S minus omega naught. That's where we have a solid line, which is quite different from the case in part C. And then the same thing happens in part D where omega naught is equal to five omega S over six, where again, the Nyquist rate is not met. Okay, so we are, we are, the time is up. So I want you to think about it. What's exactly is happening in the time domain after looking at these figures and we will continue our discussion in the next class from this point. So 
that's all I have for today. Uh, let's meet on Monday and we'll discuss what's happening in the time domain in this case of Alayasi. Have a great weekend. Thank you, you too. Have a good one.